When we say somebody's got a great brain, we're probably referring to their intelligence or smarts. If someone figures out a complex math problem, they've got a great brain. If they decode the hieroglyphics on a cave wall with great ease, they've got a great brain. If they can finish a New York Times crossword in record time, or at all, frankly, they've got a great brain. Is it accurate to say that these accomplishments are actually a reflection of their actual physical brains? Well, everything we do, what we think, what we say, how we behave, and what habits we develop springs from the complex biological processes of the brain. In fact, the brain is the center of the human. Even what we perceive as non-mental experiences and sensations like hunger and pain are dictated by neurobiology. Things like physical activities, emotional reactions, pain, or sensory development are all controlled and dictated by the brain. People with better memories tend to have larger hippocampi, and singers tend to process the act of imitation better than those who cannot sing. All of who we are comes from the unique way our individual brains have developed. Suffice to say, it is an accurate statement that someone's high functioning and intelligence, or lack thereof, is certainly a result of the structure of someone's brain. Great, on the other hand, is a matter of subjectivity. But as you'll read, it's an indisputable fact that everyone's brain is wired differently, from things as innocuous as childhood habits to the environments they were exposed to the prior week. It certainly doesn't make someone's brain inherently better than others, perhaps simply better suited for specific purposes. Luckily, we aren't slaves to the brains that we were born with. If that were true, no learning would ever be possible, and it's quite unlikely you would be able to even read this sentence. Not everyone has equal potential in any pursuit. Some people might be born with a greater propensity for music, for instance, or learning new languages. But the brain is always changing, and great takes on a wide range of definitions and metrics. Most of the time, great just means practiced or made habitual over a longer period of time. The brain goes through actual physical alteration whenever we learn a new fact, make a new memory, or meet a new person. It's how much our individual brains are accustomed to changing, adapting, shifting, and creating connections that determines how great we function and are able to achieve our goals. We call this adaptation and growth neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain to change itself in response to the stimuli it encounters. You can imagine this to be the cornerstone of learning, memory, self-discipline, habits, and even motivation. With neuroplasticity, you set your own potential. Without it, you're destined to have a brain set in stone. The ability of our brain to change and adapt is truly what makes us unique as a species. This proposition naturally leads to a near-endless set of questions. What is actually happening in the brain when we learn or create a new habit? What does neurological change actually do to us on a physical and biological level? How does neuroplasticity work, for better and for worse? Is neuroplasticity something that just happens to us, or is it something we can control to make positive changes in our lives? And, of course, I have a really big head. Does this mean I'm destined for great things? This particular question is easily answerable. Unfortunately, no, because that is the fallacy of engaging in phrenology, which is a centuries-old practice of predicting someone's temperament and intelligence based on the shape and bumps of their head. This can be lumped in with the likes of bloodletting and lobotomies in terms of questionable medical effectiveness. This book answers all of those questions. In addition to providing important background to understand yourself and your brain, we'll read about exactly the steps to take to develop yourself in just the way you want. Let's face it, not everyone was born with a great brain, at least in the areas that we want. I would have loved to be better at math, for instance, and others have developed nasty habits that hold them back from happiness. It's now time to learn how you can make neuroplasticity work for you and grow beyond what you were born with. Phineas Gage, The Case of the Pierced Brain In order to better understand how the brain works, 
it will be helpful to learn about one of the seminal cases in neurobiology, which happens to be the one that definitively tied physical brain structures to specific mental functions. The intriguing case of Phineas Gage allowed scientists to make a correlation between something tangible and what was thought to be ethereal thought and consciousness. For centuries, scientists, psychologists, and philosophers have debated the origins of emotions and personalities, what creates and triggers them, and how they are regulated. Significant progress in this field came in the aftermath of an unfortunate, and fair warning, somewhat graphic accident that happened in 1848. Phineas Gage worked as a foreman for a construction team working on a railroad bed in Vermont. It was not gentle or safe work. Gage's crew used explosive powder to blast away rock that needed to be cleared for the tracks. The gunpowder needed to be tamped or lightly packed to concentrate its power, and this was accomplished using an iron tamping rod about three and a half feet long and weighing over 13 pounds. You might be able to see where this is going. On September 13th, Gage was tamping the gunpowder with the tamping rod when it suddenly exploded right from under him. The tamping rod shot up like a javelin and pierced Gage's left cheek, tore through his brain, blasted out the top of his skull, and landed approximately 30 yards away from Gage. Gage was left with two literal holes in his head and yet was otherwise, well, relatively fine. Gage survived and was even able to communicate with attending doctors that afternoon. Historians believe he might never have even lost consciousness during the incident, even though the left part of his frontal lobe had been ripped to shreds. He did eventually lapse into a coma, during which doctors assumed he was about to die. However, Gage eventually woke up, recovered his physical strength, and was able to go back to work, though not obviously at the railroad mere months after the accident. The shocking accident and Gage's remarkable recovery might be legendary strictly on their own merit, but they also proved to be one of the most significant developments in the history of neuroscience. Did we discover that people walk amongst us with superhero-like healing abilities? Not quite. After the accident, Gage's workers, family, and friends described a significant change in his overall personality. Although no specific records exist pertaining to how they regarded Gage before the catastrophe, afterward, his friends and associates generally agreed that he was formerly friendly, good-natured, and hard-working. But after the event, he became ill-tempered and frequently drank. He became a braggart and made shocking sexual remarks without thinking. He lacked a sense of social inhibition that would have prevented him from being, to put it bluntly, a jerk. He was, for all intents and purposes, an entirely different person. But Gage's evolution into a despicable human being turned out to be a huge turning point in the study of brain science. Gage's case was the first that more or less proved the brain's role in personality. Neurobiology was still a new science in the 19th century, and scientists during Gage's lifetime were only beginning to understand the brain's role in someone's intelligence, personality, character, and overall behavior. Their dramatic change in Gage's disposition, even as his intellect and workability were, comparatively speaking, intact, inferred that the brain, especially the frontal region, is tremendously important in forming personality. These findings dramatically altered the course of neurobiology. Studies from this century have confirmed this conclusion beyond a doubt. The frontal cortex is pivotal in personality, inhibition, decision-making, and social functionality. Of course, scientists were also able to infer that no vital functions were contained in the frontal region. In 2004, 150 years after Gage's death, scientists from UCLA reconstructed his skull using digital imaging. They found that his injuries might have been more extensive than initially realized. Approximately 4% of his cerebral cortex had been destroyed, along with about 11% of the white matter in his frontal lobe. They also determined severe damage had come upon the connections between Gage's frontal cortex and his limbic system. Put simply, 
Gage underwent a left frontal lobotomy in the worst way imaginable. More centrally to the purpose of this book, Phineas Gage is a striking example of just how adaptable and changeable the brain is. It can suffer a dramatic physical change, and those changes can result in modifications to one's personality. Of course, doctors overwhelmingly advise not trying to affect the brain changes the way Phineas Gage did, but it's clear that the brain is malleable and that if one went about stimulating certain brain regions in a more convenient and beneficial manner, it's a natural conclusion that you can alter aspects of your personality and even intelligence as well. The Phantom Limb Phenomenon Further indication of the brain's complexity and fantastic adapting ability comes from examinations of an odd phenomenon that affects amputees, the phantom limb. This is a curious condition experienced by an estimated 60 to 80 percent of all amputees. The sense that the limb that's been removed is actually still there, hence the term phantom. Someone with the phantom limb sensation feels that their missing appendage is still fully functional making gestures, itching, and twitching as if it were still there. The sensation can even be painful, especially if the limb was accustomed to being in pain or was lost in a painful manner. In trying to alleviate the pain of a phantom limb, which of course can't respond to traditional pain medication, since, well, it's not there, scientists discovered that the phenomenon is directly related to brain structure and function. The brain has an amazing ability to compensate, repair itself, and adapt. And when you lose something as significant as a limb, curious things start to happen in the process of repair. As with the science behind the Phineas Gage incident, knowledge about the cause of the phantom limb has evolved as we've learned more about neurobiology. At first, scientists theorized that the phantom limb was caused by irritations in nerve endings that were cut during amputations. The severed nerves were, according to this theory, sending messages to the brain that it couldn't decipher, so it rendered them as pain. Doctors used this theory to guide their treatments of those with phantom limb, many of which included additional amputation to remove the theorized irritated nerves. This method actually resulted in the patient feeling more pain, and it also gave them yet another phantom limb to contend with. In hindsight, this is the equivalent of trying to even out a haircut to the point where there's no hair left at all. Another, somewhat dismissive and insensitive if you ask me, theory, was that the amputees simply missed their limbs and were subconsciously trying to wish them back into existence. Canadian psychologist Robert Melzack introduced the theory of the neuromatrix in 1990 in an attempt to explain the origin of phantom pain. Melzack believed that the structure of our brain's neural networks coordinates all the sensations that human beings feel. Modern research on phantom limbs centers on the primary somatosensory cortex, PSC. This part of the brain manages and processes all of the sensory input the body receives, from the five senses and also pain, warmth, body position, and so on. The PSC also carries a very precise neural map of all body parts and the nerves that represent them. There are specific locations in the PSC that correspond to specific body parts. Based on the information the PSC gets, it processes all the sensations the body feels. Neuroscientist Valayanar Ramachandran was the first to theorize that the PSC played a major part in the phantom limb phenomenon. In experimental trials, Ramachandran discovered that the PSCs of amputees get dramatically restructured, and in fact, the sensory map of the brain gets rearranged and distorted to compensate for the damage and lack of sensory information from the missing limb. In other words, the brain began to assign sensations from other parts of the body to the missing limb. This finding pointed to a link between phantom limbs and the brain's plasticity its ability to change itself. This process is known as cortical remapping and is perhaps best explained using a visual tool invented by Dr. Wilder Penfield and called the homunculus, which is Latin for little man. The homunculus represents the brain as a human being, 
terribly distorted as the size of various body parts are sized according to how many nerve endings are dedicated to them and how complex they are. The hands, lips, and genitals, for example, are greatly oversized on the homunculus because they have a wider range of sensory input, such as motion and touch, than, say, the shin or back. The homunculus might look like some sort of gremlin, but it illustrates the PSC neatly. Now, imagine that you're packing the homunculus into a suitcase. It would be folded over itself, and random body parts would be stacked and touching. The homunculus's head might touch the knee, and the hands might touch the toes and ears simultaneously. The homunculus helps to explain phantom limbs because even if a body part isn't there, the brain still has a space reserved for its sensory inputs. And in its normal course of duty, if that space reserved for a certain body part isn't used, inputs from neighboring parts of the homunculus packed into the suitcase will start to take over those regions. That's what cortical remapping means. It's when brain functions and sensations start to become associated with neighboring brain structures meant for other functions and sensations. For instance, in some trials involving people with amputated hands, when their faces were stroked, they reported experiencing a sensation in their fingers. That's because the sensory inputs for the face are extremely close to those of the hand, which isn't physically there. Some of the sensory signals received by the part of the brain that controls the face spilled over into the part that would normally control the hand. The brain saw a brain structure that was still viable, yet had no one telling it what to do, and thus it allocated it to a new function. The still existing function simply took over the vacant lot and increased its bandwidth. The phantom limb phenomenon may have dubious real-world usefulness, but it's a very real application of the brain trying to adapt, compensate, and grow. When traditional medication obviously had no cure for phantom pain, Ramanchandran conducted experiments on amputees with the device he designed, a mirror box. This was a box that had two holes on one side. In one hole, an amputee would place his still existing hand, and in the other hole, he put their phantom limb. In the box space between the holes, Ramanchandran placed a mirror. The amputee would see his existing limb in the mirror, producing the visual effect that he still had two functional limbs. Ramanchandran encouraged the amputee to make a fist with his existing hand. When the amputee did so, he'd see both of his hands, his real one and the one in the mirror, coiling into a fist. Then Ramanchandran had him uncoil his hand. In effect, this was tricking the brain into seeing both hands perform the physical actions. Again, these physical sensations were all in the mind. One of Ramanchandran's subjects continually used mirror box therapy for a week, after which he reported that he no longer had the phantom limb sensation. It was completely gone and his brain didn't register it at all. Theoretically, this was because his brain was getting so many conflicting signals that it ultimately decided there was no arm there. So the phantom vanished. Perhaps this is another piece of evidence to confirm the effectiveness of the placebo effect and how our beliefs can often create the reality we live in. While not all of Ramanchandran's subjects reported this result, the success of this one case suggests that neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to mold, fix, and change itself, is a powerful thing. It can even over-repair and overcompensate to the point of being detrimental, as the phantom limb phenomenon shows. A Primer on Brain Structure to understand the nature of neuroplasticity and the brain's ability to remake itself, it is helpful to have the basic orientation on how the brain is constructed. Knowing the main players in the brain's growth will prove beneficial when trying to ingrain positive patterns and responses. We'll try to keep this part short and snappy. The cerebral cortex is probably the most recognizable part of the brain, as we've seen the brain depicted in biology textbooks the gray matter that physically resembles a thick sponge. The cerebral cortex is the processor of thought, reason, language, and general consciousness. It may help to assign a so-called avatar to each portion of the brain, and since this portion is focused on analytical thought, 
This is the Albert Einstein portion. It is further divided into four subcomponents called lobes. Frontal, the front part of the cerebral cortex processes reasoning, expression, and body movement. This is where the iron rod blew through Phineas Gage's brain. Parietal, the middle of the cerebral cortex processes sensory information like touch, pressure, and pain. This area has the somatosensory cortex, and this is where the phantom limb is related to. Temporal. The bottom part of the cerebral cortex handles the interpretation of sounds and language through the primary auditory cortex and also processes memories through the hippocampus. Occipital. The back of the brain covers visual information we receive through the eyes. The brain stem connects to the center of the brain and conducts all the messages the brain delivers to the various parts of the body. This coordinates all our body reactions and functions eye and body movement, sleeping, blood pressure control, and so forth, based on the information relayed by the cerebral cortex. Simply, it keeps us alive. As far as avatars go, you can think of this as a starving man whose sole focus is on fulfilling his basic human needs and sustaining himself. Other parts of the brain include the cerebellum, located at the back of the skull and in charge of muscle coordination, even though by size it is only 10% of the brain, herein lie 50% of the neurons in the brain. Avatar, fight scene choreographer. And the basal ganglia, a spiral-shaped group of nuclei connected to other brain parts and associated with eye movements, learning, motor skills, knowledge, and emotion. Avatar, stuntman. In considering neuroplasticity, a part of the brain that merits specific attention is the limbic system. This is a complex series of parts that conduct all matters involving emotions, stimulation, and memories. It's often the part of our brain that we want to shut off because it is behind most of our fears and anxieties. As such, we can think of an avatar for the limbic system as an easily spooked and skittish cat who runs from everything and everyone. Major components of the limbic system include the following. Thalamus, a mass of gray matter resting between the two halves of the brain. The thalamus relays sensory and motor signals, which helps regulate the body's circadian rhythms and functions like sleep. Hypothalamus, positioned directly below the thalamus, the hypothalamus controls responses to hunger and thirst, emotions, body temperature, and the automatic nervous system. Amygdala. A tiny oval inside each of the brain's hemispheres, the amygdala is the hothouse for emotions, survival instincts, memories, and sex drive. Also part of the limbic system is the hippocampus, a prawn-shaped ridge on the base of each of the brain's lateral ventricles, basically the brain's fuel stations. The hippocampus's main objective is believed to be the formation and long-term maintenance of memories. As such, a useful avatar would be the elephant, known for its memory abilities. Out of all of the parts of the limbic system, the hippocampus is the most relevant to neuroplasticity, which we'll get to in a minute. Activity between all these parts of the brain occurs through neurons, the elemental nerve cells that run the whole show. Neurons transmit information to and from each other in the forms of both chemical and electrical stimulation. Different neurons relate to different parts of the body. While neurons can be of varying size, they all have a few common components. Dendrites, tree-like structures that receive and transmit brain information. Cell body, or soma, the energy source of neurons where signals are gathered and distributed. Axons, a fiber connected to the cell body that transmits the neural signal. In a standard neural reaction, the dendrites receive information from the sensory receptors in the brain. They pass this information through the cell body, which delivers it to the axon. The resultant electrical impulse, which at this stage is known as action potential, travels the length of the axon until it reaches a gap between neurons called the synapse. At that point, the signal either travels to the adjoining neuron automatically or gets a boost from helpful neurotransmitters, such as dopamine, serotonin, epinephrine, 
endorphins, and many others, that the axons release to help the signal cross over. Neurons are unusual in that they don't reproduce themselves like other nerve cells. Once they're gone, they rarely get replaced. But the brain can generate new neural pathways that can facilitate change in the communication between neurons. Generation of those new connections is right at the heart of neuroplasticity. Just imagine that a habit is nothing but a series of strengthened neural connections and pathways, and you'll better understand the changes we want to create. Next, we'll focus on the primary brain structures responsible for the change you seek to implement. Brain Structures in Neuroplasticity For our purposes of reshaping the brain and molding it to affect change, let's take a deeper dive into the specific brain parts and functions that are most deeply involved in neuroplasticity. We'll be coming back to these areas from time to time throughout the rest of this book. There are four main regions, the prefrontal cortex, the limbic system, the hippocampus, and the basal ganglia and striatum. Prefrontal cortex, a.k.a. Albert Einstein. Everything starts in the prefrontal cortex, which is part of the frontal lobe. The prefrontal cortex is probably where most of us exist in our minds, the conscious and analytical part of us that makes choices based on the information we've obtained. It's basically the hub of free will and our personality development, including decision-making, planning, and thought and analysis. It's like the conference room of the mind. The prefrontal cortex is where we try to organize our behavior and thoughts with the goals we've set up. It's typically associated with executive function, where we make judgments and decisions and formulate strategies to align our actions with our beliefs, like moral or value judgments, good versus bad, better versus best, qualitative assessments, similarities and differences, consequential thinking, what will happen if certain actions are taken, what's the predicted outcome, and social behavior. We use the prefrontal cortex to predict stock market rises, strategize marriage proposals, figure out if we're going to dress up as a goth, and decide where to get lunch. The prefrontal cortex, as you'll recall, is the part of poor Phineas Gage's brain that got shredded in his accident. It stands to reason, therefore, that his pre-accident personality reportedly vanished after his brain damage occurred. The social inhibitors that had kept him from being a lousy guy were permanently damaged. If we're pondering the possibilities of neuroplasticity and neural change, the prefrontal cortex is where we begin and end. It must reflect your conscious and, eventually, subconscious thoughts. When we seek to create change, the prefrontal cortex is where it starts. We must consciously make a decision to engage in a course of action until neural connections are either made or strengthened, at which point they can become the type of behavior that other structures handle. Unfortunately, it's clear that not all of our intentions translate into actions, and our tendency to act against our best interests is due to the next structure, the limbic system, a.k.a. the skittish cat. Our prefrontal cortex is in a constant battle with the limbic system, the part of the brain that's unconsciously dictating our actions by focusing on fear, survival, needs, risks, and desires. The limbic system thinks it's still the year 10,000 BC and hasn't updated itself despite the world around it changing dramatically. The limbic system is always watching out for us, which is great in theory, but it can be unnecessarily restrictive. Imagine how phobias and anxiety can derail you despite your best intentions. Those are both the result of the limbic system not being adequately balanced by the prefrontal cortex. Both the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system very badly want to make our decisions for us, and as such, they're frequently battling each other for that responsibility. It's your good old-fashioned conflict between logic and emotion. This struggle is what makes neural change and neuroplasticity so difficult. As your prefrontal cortex is making evidence and logic-based decisions, your limbic system hijacks that process with its emotional response. 
When the limbic system overrides the reasoning abilities of the prefrontal cortex, it results in the formation of bad habits. It can be as simple as wanting to not bite your nails, but biting them anyway when you feel stress. This results in neural connections that lead you down the path of additional nail biting during stress instead of less. The limbic system and the prefrontal cortex don't always butt heads. Occasionally, the limbic system can spur emotional satisfaction that overlaps with the logical functions of the prefrontal cortex, solving a tricky math problem, finishing a crossword, getting a promotion, or resolving a dispute. But the limbic system is the very epitome of a double-edged sword. Its pursuit of pleasure and or relief can be so powerful that it will overwhelm the supreme reason of the prefrontal cortex, driving one to make unfortunate choices. One function of the limbic system that can create chaos despite its best intentions is the fight-or-flight response. This subroutine happens whenever the brain encounters a frightening situation and is forced to decide whether to stay and confront the problem or get the heck out of Dodge and seek safety. The fight-or-flight response emerges from several different kinds of threats. An oncoming car, flight. A stovetop kitchen fire, fight, hopefully. A snarling attack dog, could go either way. Or a vindictive father-in-law knocking at your door with a shotgun. You're on your own. In a suddenly stressful situation, the body releases hormones that signal the body's sympathetic nervous system, which alerts the adrenal system to release hormones that spur the chemical production of adrenaline or noradrenaline. This causes the body to feel certain physical symptoms, high blood pressure, increased heart and breathing rates. The body doesn't return to normal until between 20 and 60 minutes after the threat goes away. Obviously. The fight-or-flight response is key to one's ongoing survival, but it also has certain drawbacks. Most troublesome is the fact that it doesn't differentiate between actual threats or just perceived ones. Yes, it reacts to a speeding car going through an intersection and heading straight toward you, but it also reacts to misinformation that perpetuates fear of unrealistic events. The recurrence of diseases that have been cured, a swarm of killer bees, a zombie apocalypse, or a piano falling from a tall building. These just don't happen. Not even the zombie apocalypse. And the limbic system's inaccuracy about such potential events is what leads to the development of phobias, which have an oversized influence on the super-reasonable prefrontal cortex. Additionally, the amygdala, that tiny part of the limbic system, also causes some headaches for the prefrontal cortex. Similar to the fight-or-flight mechanism that calls up our survival instinct, the amygdala processes our emotional responses to outside stimulation. Working from information sent from the thalamus through the neocortex, the amygdala decides what emotion to feel and floods the brain with hormones. This is all fine and well, unless the amygdala processes the stimuli as a threat in which case the thalamus bypasses the filtering neocortex altogether and sends info straight to the amygdala. That causes the amygdala to become a fight-or-flight arbiter on the spot, which usually leads to emotion-driven decisions, which can be very bad, though not always. The amygdala encourages a response that's more reactive than thought out. This is when we lash out at a friend or loved one for being five minutes tardy or physically lunge at someone who insults our mother. As you can see, neuroplasticity in the way we want is not always easy when it feels like we can't even dictate our behavior on a daily basis. But that feeling in itself is the result of neuroplasticity. It's only when we can override existing neural connections resulting from overactive limbic systems that we can move forward. Other components of the brain involved in neuroplasticity deal with the formation of learning, memories, and habits. By their very nature, these structures are involved in neural change. Hippocampus, a.k.a. the elephant. At the center of learning and memory in the brain, the hippocampus is a prime target for neural change and neuroplasticity.
the hippocampus deals with memory processing, especially during sleep, by consolidating and contextualizing memories we make every day. The hippocampus is not where we store memories. Instead, it manages them and sends them off to various parts in the cortex for long-term storage. Think of it as the relay station. The hippocampus is extremely responsive to neural changes, especially, unfortunately, when it gets damaged. People who suffer injuries to the hippocampus often develop amnesia or extreme difficulty in remembering events, names, and dates. As a person ages, their hippocampus typically shrinks by around 13%, which is a substantial amount. Reduction of the hippocampus can also lead to Alzheimer's disease. But the hippocampus also reacts to positive efforts to change its composition or neuroplasticity. About 700 new brain cells generate every day in the hippocampus, one of the few areas where neurogenesis exists, so it's constantly changing on its own. Physical exercise is one of the best ways to enlarge the hippocampus, and damage can even be repaired by taking antidepressants, eating foods high in omega-3 fatty acids, and abstaining from alcohol. One can even improve the hippocampus by taking on a new language or challenging themselves to solve problems or learn a new and complicated subject. Basal ganglia and striatum, a.k.a. the choreographer and stuntman. Neural change is also prevalent in the basal ganglia, which is highly associated with habits and behavior. It's vital in the process of learning new habits through neural activity that occurs in the striatum, a part of the basal ganglia that focus on movement, among other things. Neurons in the striatum act in very specific ways when a creature is learning or acquiring a certain habit. When an animal is just starting to learn a new routine, the neurons in the striatum fire constantly. As the animal develops and performs the habit over again, the neurons in the striatum fire only at the beginning and at the end of the activity. The striatum groups or chunks a series of activities as a single thing that only fires off when the whole sequence starts or ends. It's been etched into the neural pathways. That's how habits develop, for better or worse. All of these parts of the limbic system are constantly butting up against the rational prefrontal cortex, causing illogical reactions that can make one feel out of control. But through effective neuroplasticity, those parts can be retrained and remodeled, and the results can literally be life-changing. The Triune Brain Theory if you're still having a hard time understanding how the brain is constantly battling itself and making neuroplasticity something you have to proactively strive for, a hypothesis exists that might serve as a helpful representation. It's called the triune brain theory, and it was developed in the 1960s by neuroscientist Paul D. McLean. To be forthright, it's not something we can accept as biological fact. In fact, most scientists today don't subscribe to it but it could help to visualize the process of understanding the concept of the wars the brain puts itself through. It's also a great way to explain what you're up against when you're trying to effect neuroplasticity. Roughly put, the triune brain theory assigns every human three brains. Congratulations! Two of them are the brain regions we've already discussed, the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. We know they are in constant battle with each other, which prevents neuroplasticity. The third one roughly corresponds to the basal ganglia, the habit-processing part of the limbic system we just described. The first brain was described by McLean as the neomammalian complex, what we've described as the prefrontal cortex. This is the kind of structure that's exclusive to so-called higher mammals, like human beings and other very closely related primates. It gives us our capacity for thought and consciousness, language, planning, and so forth. Unfortunately, this is not where our priorities lie. The second brain is the paleomammalian complex, or what we've discussed as the overall limbic system. As the name implies, McLean likened this part of the brain to older, 
prehistoric mammals who didn't have much immediate need for reflection or deep understanding. They just needed to feed themselves, procreate, and watch after the kids. But they needed to have a sensation that spurred these activities on. To eat, they needed to feel hungry. So the paleomammalian complex reflects those primal urges, hunger, sexual arousal, parental drive, and the emotions they call up. This is where our priorities lie, first and foremost. Thus, it is away from here that we want to rewire our neural pathways. The third brain is the R complex, or the reptilian complex. This loosely corresponds with the basal ganglia. It's so named because scientists used to believe that reptiles, and birds for that matter, were driven by raw instinct more than carefully considered need and biological imperative. We're talking domination and aggressive attacks on other species, territorial marking, and ceremonial acts like a peacock showing its plumage. We also want to rewire our neural pathways away from this brain. The triune brain theory simply states that these three brains are always at each other's, well, throats. Your rational, advanced human brain knows full well that it needs to do certain very practical things and that if you do them fully, you'll more likely get positive results. But the caveman-like, paleomammalian brain is always interrupting the prefrontal cortex with its primitive urges and emotions. And when you throw the reptile brain on top, with its raw hunger and savagery, forget it. All your best laid plans are now in utter chaos. The change you want requires your neo-mammalian brain to constantly win, but that's tough to accomplish. It's a literal battle to carve out the neural change you desire. Another way to think about the arrangement of the brains is in terms of energy expenditure. The prefrontal cortex needs a lot of gas to do its work. You have to constantly call up the reserves to think thoroughly about a situation, ponder the pros and cons, create something, predict an outcome. It's literally brain power, and you need it to think things through. The limbic system, on the other hand, is almost automatic. It takes nothing to process emotions or instantaneously react out of mere instinct. The limbic system loves the path of least resistance because it's easier and takes less energy to maintain. The reptilian complex falls somewhere in between. Once again, the introduction of the triune brain is for illustrative purposes only. It's a fair model to explain what areas are most responsive to and maybe most in need of neuroplasticity. It shows the constant conflict we face and why building a better brain is not as simple as making the decision to do so. It shows us why our actions don't match our intentions and how our brains work against us in many cases. McLean's triune brain shows the general overlay of neuroplasticity and the massive effort that must be undertaken. You could let yourself be taken in by your survival instincts, which leads to bad habits and destructive patterns of thought. This is where you would listen solely to your limbic system, paleomammalian brain and reptilian complex. It's usually the path of least resistance and the path of most immediate gratification. It's what most of us do day to day. But neuroplasticity and the neural change you want is completely within your control. It's a lot more effort, and it requires delaying gratification but the payoff can be immense. We can direct neuroplasticity ourselves to effect positive changes and habits in our lives. And this book will explain how. Takeaways. What does it mean to build a better brain? Are our intelligence, functioning, and behaviors a result of our brains? In a nutshell, yes. Our brains are the center of who we are and they dictate what we do even when we try to avoid it. Neuroplasticity is the process of the brain developing, changing, growing, and adapting to whatever it is exposed to, and it can be used to quite literally build a better brain. A couple of examples are stark illustrations of just how the brain can change, for better or for worse. Phineas Gage is a man who had an iron rod blown through a part of his brain. He lived and could still function as a relatively normal human being, 
albeit off-putting and fairly unpopular. This is because the iron rod tore through his prefrontal cortex, the portion of the brain responsible for personality and inhibition. This shows how the brain has separate structures for separate functions. Next, the phenomenon of phantom limbs is when amputees feel sensation or pain where their limbs used to be. This occurs because of cortical remapping, which is when adjacent parts of the brain take over parts that used to be used for the missing limb. This shows just how the brain compensates, heals itself, and changes physically. When it comes to specific brain structures, there are a few that we will focus on as they relate to neuroplasticity and making changes. These include the prefrontal cortex, which is where conscious and analytical thought occurs, the limbic system, which is the emotional system that clashes with the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, where memory is processed, and the basal ganglia, where habits are formed and processed. Neuroplasticity is neutral, occurs in response to what it sees, and can be beneficial or detrimental. A helpful framework for understanding how neuroplasticity works is the triune brain theory. While not 100% correct and precise, it makes clear the forces at play in making neural changes. This theory states that there are three primary brains that are always at battle. The neomammalian, roughly corresponding to the prefrontal cortex, paleomammalian, roughly corresponding to the limbic system, and reptilian brain, roughly corresponding to the basal ganglia. The latter two brains are instinctual and subconscious. While changes made have to be conscious and thoughtful at first, so neuroplasticity depends on the ability of the neomammalian brain, prefrontal cortex, to win a certain percentage of the time.